Hey, um, this is Sitok Mas. We're live in Berlin from Paloma Bar, Cottbus Tour. Um, for the next, I don't know how long, for the next couple of hours, we're going to be uh, discussing some of my productions. Um, two tracks that we're going to talk about mainly are True Lies. This is from SK11 number six. Um, after this, we're going to talk about one of the tracks uh, from Soma. This is from the Surface for Air EP. This is my first EP on Soma Records. Uh, that one's called To Not Exist. Um, a little bit about myself, if you don't know who I am. Um, from Manchester, England. Um, been producing for many years for the past, I don't know, um, 11, 11 years. 10, 11 years, um, releasing lots of music on various labels. Some of my biggest uh, releases would be on uh, Figure, which is a label from Germany, a label from Len Faki and crew, um, based in Berlin. Um, Spencer Parker's label called Work Them. Uh, during this time, I started my own label. It's called SK11, which is a postcode from my hometown. Um, Thank you to my dad for funding it. Um, after this, um, I started an alliance with uh, Soma Records from Scotland, from Glasgow, which is very close to my heart. They're amazing guys, doing great stuff. Um, yeah, so the first track that we're going to talk about is going to be True Lies. As I said, this is from SK11 number six. Um, I guess it's kind of, it's kind of my biggest selling track, my most popular track. Always get asked about this track, um, get asked to play it, get asked how I made it. So I thought now is the perfect opportunity while we're in this global crisis to discuss something um, which means a lot to you. And I guess a lot of you have spent some time with this track. Um, it's kind of a for me now opening the project when I thought about um when I thought about doing the tech talk with this track, I opened up the project after many uh I don't know when it was released actually, I can't remember exactly. Maybe it was last year or the year before that. Um I probably didn't open the project since then. Um and it's funny to funny to look back at it because um I guess my production skills have improved a lot since since this time, but I kept it. I didn't change anything since I opened up the project. I kept it how it is and how it how it um, sounded from then. I tidied it up a little bit because there was obviously a lot of <coughs> effects and various things switched off, um, all these different things. So I guess you can all see my screen right now. Um, I guess a lot of the people are always asking me about how I do my kicks. Um, this is something which I spent a lot of time on. I spent a lot of my early years of production trying to get this these techno kicks, trying to get this sound, um <coughs> trying to get this density in the kick drums which you hear. Um, some of my methods include... Um, Analyzing a lot of other tracks, dropping them in, um, seeing how the waveform looks, trying to replicate this um, in the session view in Ableton um, with audio and different things. So, I mean, we're going to get started and I'm going to um, go into this. So, <coughs> yeah, you can all see my screen, I guess, and I hopefully most of you have tuned in by now, unless they're going to miss a little bit. Um, I guess there should be some cross posting from Soma and from Hor. I guess they are got them guys who are live now. Um so yeah, all of them are live, I've heard. Um so yeah, it's all about these live streams these days and I hope this is gonna give you a little bit of insight into um my production and maybe help you out in this time. Uh, so you can also get your head into this, into this game while maybe a lot of people are having a bit f more free time. Um, <coughs> so let's start on this, this kick, this kick here. It's from, I actually don't know how I made this. 
<laughs> so that's a good start. But this is from an older production of mine. It was called Drawn Figures, and I guess I made this kick drum um, using uh, lots of different layers. Um, so I'll solo the kick right now. Um, make sure my volumes are all okay. Um, I would, before we start, I would advise everybody to use headphones or monitors when listening to this because you're not going to get the full effect if you're listening through laptop speakers. So I would stress that to listen through some sort of other thing than laptop speakers. Because, um, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to be working a lot in the sub bass frequencies, a lot of it in the lower mids. Um, so yeah, this, as I said, this is, um, this is definitely an older production of mine, but it's, it's still one of the most popular. I'm not ashamed of it. It's still still a nice track when I listen back to it. So, um, yeah, the kick drum here, it is, it's mainly, um, oops, uh, it's going to be layered with a lot of different textures. Um, the starting point for me is the most important. It's this hard click at the start. Um, if we look at the spectrum analyzer, you can see the frequencies, and this is this is something which I have on all my all, almost all of my channels. It's this spectrum analyzer, and this shows you the it shows you the frequencies which is hitting, and it's a really key also to producing key. So you can see at the bottom. I can't highlight anything on my screen, unfortunately, but you can see down here uh, to the left hand side. You can see that this is in the key of A, 54.9 hertz. Um, Turn this up a little bit so I have some volume. Um, that's one layer. That's the first layer. And then it has a second layer here, which is just a punch of the kick, which is a small punch. And it also has an EQ8. I like to use this Camel Fat. I actually forgot all about this uh, Camel Fat plugin. You'll have to bear with me. My computer's a little bit slow, so you might see the rainbow a few times, but we'll open it up. And. Um, the camel fight has various different distortion methods. You can bit crush, um, you can use another mechanical one, you can use a tube, um, as you can see here, bit crusher, mechanical exciter, tube. So mainly it's running through the tube distortion. And I think for these um, textures over the top of kick drums, distortion is your best method um, to be... Um, this channel also has zero compression on it, so you can see that people often talk about compression. It's not always that necessary, you know. If you're using a long, long vocal sample, then um, this would you would have to tame them um, peaked frequencies with a compressor. With a kick drum, you kind of want to use it as a tool to. Um, to add character or to bring out a little click or a tiny little element. Yeah, so this Camel Fat from Camel Audio, I don't even know if it's still available anymore. I think the company went bankrupt or something happened with them, but you may be able to find this somewhere uh, on the internet and it's, I would highly recommend it. It has a lot of um, great features on there, as you can see from the bandpass filter and these flangers, EQ compressors, low pass filters, distortions. Um, we'll go back to the main kick now. You can see it's only a tiny bit of EQ, but I say I'm really sorry that I couldn't bring up exactly how I made this, but I do have an example kick to show you very like in the next segment. This is all grouped. As always, we're gonna use groups. Um, it has a Pro C on there has an API, this is API 560, modeled on the um, hardware version. This is from Waves. <coughs> um, has the Ableton saturator on there, warm-up lows. I don't think I even adjusted the, uh, the settings on that. I added a boost before everything. This is a boost, um, quite a wide boost in the lower frequencies to just add that emphasis. Let's listen to them both together. So you can see um, that's actually added in this little bass here, so take that out. This compressor is just taming everything, basically. Um, and then the AP. 
API. That's bringing up a few low mids and um, also bringing out some upper frequencies. You can see here 16, 8, 4K, they're all boosted. Coming down to the middle, it kind of stays the same. Uh, low mids, 250, 125. API is great because it's working on um, them them frequencies in the lower mids and also the ba uh, also the bands um, it's only separating these bands I don't know what I don't know what sort of cue um, this is on to be honest I never researched that but I'm sure it's on like a medium Q style um, medium width uh, Q uh, going into here kind of funny I have uh, just a one singular bass stab here and this is from a uh, Dr. Dre sample pack that I have that a friend gave me, Dan Mumberson, ever grateful for your, all your samples, Dan. Um, this here, Nep Neptune slash Dre. So it has a bunch of <coughs> samples in there and they're all really, um, they're all really, they've got loads of character. You really have to like chop them up to like get rid of the character because they're really, they're really strong. They've been processed a lot with like a lot of different layers, and I would say they're pretty high quality. Um, so if you listen to them together, it just kind of adds that little bump at the end. You know, the syncopated rhythm right at the very end on this 1.14, um, and that's also. Let's have a look at this master um, spectrum analyzer. Let's close that. That's annoying. Sometimes you can even see it better like this in this view. Um, you can see here that this this is just adding a little little bump in this low mid section. It's super low. It's not super low, but it's like quite low. 70 hertz, 75 hertz. Also adds the additional character up through the frequency range to this upper harmonics because this is really key. I think people want to get this low sub they want to get these low frequencies but without the low without the upper harmonics you're not going to get them low frequencies because of the way the psychoacoustics works so on here i have the ableton overdrive which i love i use this uh, still to this day i use this all the time um <coughs> it's on 100 percent wet and it's down to the pretty pretty much as far as it can go in the low in the low mids again Dynamics stays the same. Dynamics is on the overdrive is making more compression or less compression. So it's a 50, so it's medium, medium. Um, drive stays the same, but it's 100% wet. And the tone also stays the same. I don't want it to sound duller and I don't really want it to sound brighter. Um, I added in the low pass before the overdrive because if I added in the overdrive before this, then it's just going to uh, really distort this um, the bass sound in a really... Uh, not very nice way. <coughs> There's a question from Simon. He's asking, do you cut everything below 30 hertz on your bass drum, kick drum? So Simon, um, I heard there was a question. Uh, to be honest, I don't. This is my pre-master channel here. On my kick drum, I will, I mean, you can see it's rolled off here at 30 hertz, but it's not a steep incline. I mean, if we were to bring up the, um, for me, that is enough because sometimes there is a little bit of, there's a little bit of something in, in them low, low, low frequencies. It adds a little bit of feeling maybe or something else. I know that it does generally eat up headroom. And I was looking today and I did some analysis of like how much headroom is actually eating up. So... I think on the Ableton one here, you know, this um, times four, if, if I'm hovering over it now, you can see the times four. To be honest, sometimes that changes a lot of the character in the sound. I would say if you can get your hands on the Pro Q2 or Pro Q3 they're now brought out, this adds, um, let me turn up the volume a little bit. And also I'm just going to um, put this on. There, it doesn't really make a make a sound difference, but the EQ8 from Ableton, it will make a slight sound difference. Um, I 
don't always roll off from 30 to be honest. Most of the time I will uh, I will EQ out the low end quite a lot from synths and other different things, but I think the bass sometimes has a little bit of something there. So I think you should maybe, on this EQA for example, you have these uh, various octaves. You can go 72, 48 decibels, sorry, 36, 30, 24. Um, put this on a little bit of a small, smaller, 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 um, decline something rather than more like that or something like that so you're just rolling off but you're not changing the character of the sound because you you don't want to change the character of the sound at all you want to keep that you want to keep that there you know when you start going up there you hear this slight difference it's all very minute differences but it's gonna make a difference so to answer your question i don't always roll off at 30. maybe i should there's another question for bass. Uh, Remy is asking, do you use or do you put your bass in mono, for example, with the Ableton Stock utility plugin? So uh, I think the name was Remy. Um, yes, of course. This will have all, all been in mono before. Maybe this upper half here, this Dr. Dre sample basing, maybe that's not in mono, but we're going to check now because we can just go with. Oops. Oops, uh, I forgot how you do that again. Well, normally I should be able to see the sides because here. Uh, there we go, yeah. Damn, I forgot how to do that. Uh, let me use this other plugin. I'll show you another plugin. It's Melder Productions. I'm normally used to using this on the um, for stereo width and stereo spread. I think it's this stereo processor. Stereo expander. So let's delete that one. How do you do that again? <laughs> Check the side. Yeah, I can't remember. Stereo spread. There's a way I could. the EQ8 for example let's load that up you can come here you can go onto mid side and you can just hit here there's the sides only the sides you can see there is a little bit of something there but more than likely it's only going to be in the upper halves so yes bass always in mono to be honest because sound systems in mono is going to make it punch more oh I know uh, did I forget how to do this no where is this I'm not used to this new Ableton 10 one wants to tell me how to do that then balance I'm sure you used to be able to do it a bit easier on Ableton 9 um, but yeah bass always in mono so let's move on a little bit further Keep this up a little bit on my side um, one thing I noticed when I was going through this track I'm gonna let it run through a little bit one thing that I really noticed was this textured perk section here. I labeled it now. Um, what's that? So I left on the automation that you can see here. On the channel, it's grouped again. The group channel has a tape from J37 tape, saturation tape, whatever you want to call it, tape machine on there. Um, this adds a lot. This adds a lot of um, character to sounds. So if you can get your hands on any tape, tape emulations or a real tape machine, you know, big up like Steph Mendesidis using the proper one at his home studio. Um, I've seen that in action, it sounds amazing. Um, but these emulations are also really good. So the Wave Zoo one, uh, there's a few that I now have the Universal Audio stuff. So they have a few Studio 8000. things add a lot of depth. You can use it on bass drums, hi-hats, you can use it on the whole thing, you can use it on a master channel if you really wanted to and add a small little bit. I'm sure this is what these IDM guys from the 90s were doing, the tape on the master channel, Aphex Twin, all these people. So I'm going to solo my, uh, before we get to the bleepy section, which I know you all want, um, I'm 
gonna t- add uh, soul in this texture perk because I think this is one of the main rhythm sections in the track. And without this, if you wanna hear it without it, it's the track is not the same. I would I would say. So that's how it is now. And if you listen closely, take that away. There's a lot of energy that's lost. There's a lot of. Um, I feel like this adds a lot of somehow organic texture to the track. Um, It's playing kind of a syncopated rhythm. As you can see, 1.12, 1.13, it's got a lot of velocity movements. Um, I guess the thing is with my productions and the way that I work, I resample a lot of audio. And later on, I'm gonna re- show you about resampling, about how, we c- how you can do that and how you can manipulate the sounds. So this is, um, this is uh, two different audio channels playing this one group one here. That's a low, low texture. Um, This has reverb, delay, EQ3. This is more used as kind of an automation method because you can see here I've automated the sound to bring it up and down. It's kind of like an auto filter, but uh, it's exactly the same as an auto filter, but I don't know why I used that. I just did. Um, Sometimes things are unexplainable. It's side chained, of course, side chained to the main kick. (coughs) <coughs> um, everything side chained. Always, everything is always side chained in my music. You have to make space for the kick drum to stand out, and you also have to give things their own space in the frequency ranges. Uh, the upper half, oh, I didn't show you here, but here, this is the same sample pitch down. This is to add depth, to add character, to add another another weight be- beneath the beneath the upper half. It's kind of. Um, in my life, I studied architecture, a form of architecture, and it's kind of like building a house, you know? It's like, you have to start with the foundations, you have to get them solid, and all these different layers, they're all foundations, they're all like m- coming together to make a final piece. So instead of just boosting the EQ, and just on this, for instance, I could just ramp up the EQ at around 200 hertz, but I added an extra layer to make it a little bit more gritty and to add something else. You can see the spectrum analyzer here. I'm gonna close that because I know that's annoying for people there. Um, It's adding in some bass frequencies, which is fine by me. It's all gonna go together if it's in the same key. It's not gonna have any phase issues if it's gonna be in the same key. Um, The upper half is just more of a roof, like it's just more, it's just a top layer, you know, it's just splitting the layers up. Um, and together, on their own, together, you can see the difference that it makes. It adds that depth. Um, so let's go. I have to hold this mic. It's kind of annoying. <laughs> um, can't use two hands. Um, so let's go into this sine wave bleep. Let's let it play for a little while longer. track looks like take with them loop braces. Um, you can see up to here it has 21 channels. I don't really know where they're all coming from. They just happen to appear 21 channels. The main bleep sequence here, I'm gonna loop it from this next section. So yeah it's kind of a little mini breakdown there, the hi-hats come out and stuff. Um, we're gonna look at that. So yeah, as uh, from the question before, most of my uh, upper instruments are um, cut quite drastically. Um, the lows are cut quite drastically all the way through to give space for the bass and the kick drum to really shine through. Um, it's also got a pro C because the uh, spikes on these bleeps are quite, they're quite intense. So it has a fast attack and a long release. 
as you can see here, is pretty much the maximum. Um, it has kind of a softish knee, just to round it off. I didn't want to like totally wipe out the bleepy noises, but you'd know they need to be tamed. Um, so yeah, the attacks all the way down, release ratio, threshold is like this, as you can see. Um, there's a small, let's have a this is how that sounds on the headphones here. We're going to look at this little problem frequency, obviously, here. That's kind of resonant in the low end, low mids. Um, I can't use two hands, so bear with me. This section here, you can hear this singing resonance, as Connor Dalton likes to put it, um, the great master and engineer. Um, it's taught me a lot about these resonances and about how to get rid of them and about spotting them and how to deal with them basically. Big ups Connor. Um, so you can hear it's really singing. That should probably be going down a little bit more to be honest. I should be really out of the out of the sound. Um, overdrive again. Dynamics here. It's got this um, it's got the dynamics all the way down so that the compression is, I think it says it's at the maximum. Higher settings, less compression, higher settings, yeah. So it's, it's compressing a lot, the sound, with the overdrive. And it also adds a little bit more character, so on and off, there's a little bit of sparkle which comes. It's on the highest bandwidth which it can be to, um, to uh, overdrive the whole of the signal. Um, you can hear the difference when you flick it on and off. Okay, um, let's have a look into how I made that. It's in Synthmaster 2, which is a plugin from KV331, I think is the name. KV331. And if any of you watched my um, Electronic Beats interview, then I know some of you were asking the questions about what sequencer I like to use. I think techno is revolved around sequencers and it's revolved around this um, repetitive sound and this uh, automatically triggering MIDI samples. Um, so the one that I like to use is ML185. This is a um, Max for Live instrument and if you're not using Max for Live then you should be basically. It's an amazing tool. Um, uh, this has an amazing rand random function on it. Um, which is more than likely how I came up with that sequence, just clicking a few randoms, and uh, sometimes that's how the best music is made, isn't it? Just by chance and luck. I cropped out these two sections, so it's playing an eight, it's playing a two bar sequence. Uh, sorry, one bar sequence, is it? Over a 16 notes. Let's see what it's doing. That's the lower half. Next one. This is, I called that a low moog because inside the KV331, this is um, the presets called Smooth Moogie. Um, it's playing a sawtooth and a mi mini moog sample because this uh, this VST here is a wavetable synthesizer, so it has a lot of emulations from different, um, different um, manufacturing companies such as Moog or Korg or uh, Dope for from the um, from the um, modular stuff. If you have a look at this, I don't want to mess it up because I might change the sound, but you can see it has all these waveforms. Um, they all are amazing. So you've got the Arp Odyssey stuff, you've got the Prophet stuff, you've got Rhodes Piano, Buckler, Easel Buckler, the Dope for FM stuff, asymmetrical stuff, which is really nice to use for techno, Yamaha, maybe, yeah, for CS80 stuff. I made a lot of good music on this, uh, the track that me and Cleric did together, Big Up Cleric, um, called 188. Um, this came out of this synth, the main, the main sound came out of this synth. Um, it's a great, great tool, this um, KV331. Um, okay, let's unsolo everything. So, <coughs> we're still looping this one section. Um, both of these are playing um, the sequence sound. They are playing 
the same pitches inside the sequencer. Oh no, sorry, they're not. One's playing at uh, plus six semitones, the other's playing at plus ten semitones. Um, so they are slightly layered. The Moog is a little bit higher, but the Moog has that kind of, you know, it has that we've got gritty uh, mid bass sound. This one has more of that FM sine wave style. So this really adds the depth to the sound. So that's all about layering the sounds and about how it works. And then when you bring up that um, extra bit, you can see here I have this uh, EQ3, which is automating the sound. Uh, also overdrive again, always overdriving everything. Yeah, adds that gritty stuff. Also camel fat again, I see here. Also has some compression on there. EQ3 is uh, automating that sound to bring out them higher frequencies. This bit, the little bell chimey uh, thing that's coming in and out of the track the whole time if we scan through it, coming up and down, that's kind of the bit which uh, people get lost in, I guess, when the second half comes in. Okay, let's start here. We go from the breakdown bit, we listen to the breakdown. kind of <coughs> a long breakdown. I normally wouldn't, in this now, in this day, I wouldn't make a breakdown this long, to be honest. Yeah, it's super simple. But you know, simplicity in music is kind of the best form. I uh, don't know why it's peaking over there. Obviously adjusted something. Let's bring it down a little touch. Um, Simplicity, Robert Hood, you know, Minimal Nation, you're not going to beat this album. The best music is, is simple because that's what attracts the mind, I guess. Um, and generally, it's all about this automation. You can see this, you can see the spike in this, uh, bringing up the upper harmonics here, and dropping them back down. It's all, it's all in the automation. It's all about keeping that interest throughout the track. Um, if you turn any of these off, it's going to, there's nothing left if it's like that. But for s these three, these three layers here, they just work really well together. They all play off each other. They all, they're all in tune with one another. They're all, they're all bouncing off one another. So when one fades out, another one will come in. Um, that's how generally I like to work my automation. Is if one thing is coming in, then another thing is fading out, but only small amounts. You know. Small 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 like you don't overdo it by chopping and changing just especially with maybe just the style of music that I make it's all uh, journey style um, the second half the second half here um, has these chords which come in well not chords they're just uh, two notes as you can see here it's that very standard, creepy style, uh, haunting, uh, haunting, I wouldn't call it a chord, it's just two notes, it's uh, separated, it's playing a B and an F, I remember, yeah, it's playing a B and an F. Um, anything else on this scale? Going up, you know, down it gets a little bit orchestral, you know, it's a little bit too deep. Going down again, going too deep, you know, it's going to start, adds a different vibe to the track, but up here, um, up here at uh, around C, uh, F4, so it's in the fourth octave, that's where it sounds the best, to be honest, and that's all, and it sounds, it sounds good, um, one second, I have to use two hands. And it also sounds good with the uh, bleeps in there as well. I mean, it could also be a little bit louder. Um, 
could also come up a little bit in the track, but it's more of like a, an atmospheric, uh, sustained sound. It's just there to have a placeholder in the track. It adds, adds another form of interest all the way through. Let's go back a little touch. We're going to go on to the other sections. Okay, the tom. Very standard tom sound. It's got a delay. And it's playing a repetition note. The, warp, the start marker's moved forward because obviously it sounded better there. Um, to play around with your warp markers just to see. Sometimes you make a rhythm, but sometimes it could sound better in another position, you know. So still going to play the same length. It just changing the start positions. That's a standard tom. This is from the Gold Baby sample pack. Um, if you've not heard of the Gold Baby Sample Pack, then um, they do some great um, 909 emulations. Um, so I have here Super Analog. These are all the Gold Baby ones. They sound amazing. Obviously, they're all, and they're all ran through different sorts of distortions. So there's hard distortion, there's little ones, there's tape, there's like really, I think they ran through some high end gear as well. They have all of the all of the drum sounds from the 909. They also have the tape 808 as well, which is all the 808 stuff, which is run through tape. So you can have the original tape and then tape saturation. Um, they have some great stuff, and sometimes they don't they don't even need processing. They're that good, to be honest. Maybe it's just some EQ to make it fit in with your track. Um, as you can see here, I cut out the lows on the simpler, which I always use simpler cut out the lows, got no resonance, so it's just coming solely up, it's not going to spike anywhere. don't know why there's a flange there, but it should be deleted. Um, got the auto filter, just taking off some high end to delay, just there, uh, just to add that little bit of something. It's playing uh, three dotted notes, so if you take it off, just it's just adds that extra bit of space to the track and adds that extra interest. We talked about the perk before. That's really vital to this track, I think. So, Claps. I like claps. Sound good. I loop that here. I listen to them for a little second. I like claps. They they're amazing. They're the best part of techno music, I think. My syncopated claps. Um, it's just ducked a little bit in the low, in the upper mids, and then brought up a little bit to add that high, um, add that higher interest. It's also side chained, I think, from the main kick with a little bit of reverb on there to add the space. Take that away. You can hear that it's not got much, but it also has a reverb on the send here as well. we'll talk about the sends in a minute. Um, put that reverb back on. The overdrive is there again, adding that distortion, adding that general overdrive to the track. Take that off. You can see, I mean, there's a little bit of volume difference. You should always gain stage your um, distortion levels to the output levels because sometimes the distort what you think is distortion is just adding volume it's not actually adding any form of distortion um so you should gain stage properly um what you're actually doing to that sound and um because yeah sometimes the distortion levels are just um they're just increasing the volume, they're not actually distorting the sound. So yeah, just A, B that sometimes. Go into this view, um, go into your, uh, whatever you call this view. So use this thing, I don't even call it anything anymore, it's just a name. Uh, it's just a thing. Um, minus six. Yep. Ben is asking, what's the original source material for the textured perks? Okay, so Ben, the texture perks, yeah, they sound. I know they sound good as well. I don't know uh, exactly where that came from, but from what I can see from this waveform here, it looks to me like it's a couple of layered, um, 
I laid kick drums because as I said earlier, I resample everything. So I bounce everything to audio. So it sounds like it's got a little bit of delay on there. It could have also come from a send channel because sometimes I will have maybe toms, a layer of a kick, a click of a kick, low end of a tom. I'll bust that to a send channel. Um, and that will have the delay on, a fully wet delay. It will have um, some distortion. It would have uh, compression. It would have uh, side chain. And then I would just generally make a uh, separate audio channel, as you can see here. And I go audio from. And I go audio from, like, uh, I go audio from any of these. So let's take it from the texture perk. Let's resample that. Hit, rec hit the re arm record button here. And then hit record. And what you're going to see is the audio coming from this track 12. You're going to see that all recording there. Um, and I make all my music like this. That's why it's kind of difficult to explain exactly my process behind it. But I will try and do a little bit. Um, because I resample absolutely everything. Um, and I work a lot with audio. Um, and sometimes it's, it's good and bad, you know. But that's my method from day one. So... So now you can see you have that long stretch of audio. You can, I mean, if my computer was a little bit better, it would be a little bit more quantized, but my computer's a little bit slow. So you can chop that up there. You can add, uh, then you can make this, you can make this into a polyrhythm by extending this. And then, you know, you come up with a whole new track from this uh, thing. Just from that one little resampled audio and putting that into a, a polyrhythm, you have a whole different track. And then also when you go onto the beach, you can change this beat section here, change it to 16th. Just a tiny little click, you know, just shortening all that audio on 16th. Uh, you can now transpose it. That could be used as like another texture underneath the track. I mean, yeah, I quantize that properly. U S command U, but yeah, it's got a nice bit of distortion on them, uh, on them uh, textured perk. Um, but you know, it's so easy when you're work working in audio just to chop out different sections. And also, when I'm playing the keys and stuff like that, if I if I play some sort of melody on the keys, I will continue playing for mm, like a few minutes or something with like a synth line or something. And I will I'll be recording that whole thing and then maybe I'll just take a small, small section. So I'll take only like uh, four bars out of this section. I'll just use that. Um, that's why I really like working with audio because you can just crop out exactly what you want. You can just use a tiny little bit of that and use it as a texture. Like a lot of my music has a lot more layers in this. It's an older one, you know, this, uh, yeah. Okay, so the genuine the question was, uh, how did I make that? I guess it's just a lot of layers and a lot of processing. I guess a, a tom layer, a kick layer, um, some delay, and saturation on the top of the on the upper half, um, compression, um, and uh, com uh, I said compression, side chain compression, onto the kick to make it um, to kind of level it out a little bit. Um, also, I guess there's also reverb on here, and I said that I would speak about reverb and about how it's used and about how it's uh, very a versatile tool and how it's um, how it is just it adds everything to music. This reverb it adds everything from the hi hats. We're gonna talk about the hi hats and the reverb inside the hi hats because it just adds that space and it adds that. Um, Bef it gets too stagnant when it's not got reverb but for me it feels like it gets too stagnant it's like got not got that life I think reverb brings life to sounds so let's have a look at these um, hi-hats I'll loop this section here <laughs> So, um, hi-hat group. Everything is always in groups. Putting everything together. 
I think somebody asked me a question about buses. Not public transport, I mean like these sorts of buses. <laughs> um, so that's where a lot of the processing happens. You can see again the side chain is on there. The side chain from the main kick. You got the tape again on the hi hats because this is this is you just need tape on everything. Um, EQ chopping out the lows. Also, you need to, in my opinion, you should balance frequency. So this is bringing up the bringing up more of the higher mids or the mid mids. Overdrive again. Um, it's not a bass, but I use the bass punch parallel preset from Ableton. Um, it's, the attack is quite long in terms of, it's not too long, but you know, it's 10 milliseconds. The release is quite short and it's hitting at a ratio of 10. So it's quite, um, the ratio of 10 is quite hard. It's not close to limiting, but it's quite hard. Um, I use this BLN sample. It's an audio sample and I chopped off some of the, uh, I kind of did like a little transient shaper with the envelope here. Um, transpose it down by six. This uh, second part is an upper, an upper, um, an upper section of the hi-hat just to, so you have a, you can hear the difference. You can hear that more sharp MIDI stuff. Then you want to add that sheen on top of it. You want to add that sparkle. So these two go together. That's kind of one sound. I mean, if you wanted to, then you could render that down into one sample audio. For me, I kept it separate. For some reason, it's got a limiter on both of them. I don't know why. Probably because I was too lazy to use uh, compression. Um, so I just limited it. Just got it squashed. Um, impulse next. That's using two 909 samples. The 909 samples, if I look at the bottom of the screen, they're coming from that gold baby super analog sample pack that I told you about before. Then we go to the Valhalla vintage reverb. Um, it's only tr playing 12% of that reverb. I mean, if it's wet, then it's gonna sound like that, but it's just having a tiny little bit and then some uh, genuine, genuinely just E like different bits of EQ on the reverb as well with small pre-delay. I guess that's kind of a basic setting on Valhalla. I don't know whether I did that or whether my computer actually reset to that default method. There. Also pushing up the pushing up the frequency at 9,000 hertz to give that sparkle at the top. You can see on the spectrum analyzer here. Um, play them all together. Sounds like one. That's what you want to do with these these hi hats. You want to kind of make it sound like one. Um, okay, the next section, let's go back to these hi-hats, see what they are. There's some more glassy shakers. They also have a Valhalla on. Looks to me like my computer reset the Valhalla vintage verb when I reopened the project. I don't know why. It's playing kind of the same thing here. It's got a little bit more of the mix on, but yeah. Still has reverb on there. These are playing this KPHE Progressive House Essentials sample pack, if you want to know my secrets. <laughs> that's how <laughs> that's how I roll. Sample packs, if they are made well, then they you can use them. Like why not? You could use some micro house sample pack, or you could use anything. You just as long as it works for you, you can use whatever you like. Um, let's put them all together. Um, so there's a little bit of separation between them shakers. They're playing. Uh, let's have a look at the spectrum analyzer. They're playing, um, I think they were more a little bit higher to be honest. I normally in my current production method, I would side chain the shakers to the um, to the main hat to like give the main hat space. For some reason I haven't done that here because I was a little bit younger. You learn a few more methods over time. Um, yeah, so the main hi-hat is playing more of a mid hat with a little bit of glass. The shakers on top, they're adding a little bit of sparkle and the separated kind of, I think frequency masking is a big issue in music and in production methods. So you need to separate them frequencies even in the higher ranges, like you do the bass frequencies. Um, let's listen to the track again. I think I kind of went through everything that makes this track. I went through the claps. Um, on the end of here, the send channels, the send always 100% wet, so it's not going to affect the sound which you're using. 
it's going to just add on top of it. It's not going to um, start changing that sound which you're using. Um, like if you put a 100% reverb on a kick drum, then it's going to change that sound. There were two questions about inserts versus return channels. Like, what's your approach on that? Like, whether you have the reverb on the channel or whether you use it as a uh, return channel. So, there's a question about the sending returns. I generally have both because different um, different sounds require different treatments. So, you see, I have the Valhalla reverb on the on the actual sound, on the actual hi hat here. Let's uh, solo that and see how it sounds on and off. Because it is adding that little spark there. Take it off. Adds a little bit of sustain, adds a little bit of elongation to the sound. It brings it out a little bit more, lengthens it slightly. And then it's also, I also have like maybe 21% here, 21 uh, D minus 21 dB going to the return. So generally I have both. Um, let's have a look at the uh, mixer here because you can see it through better. So these ones, uh, whatever that is, that has more, like you can see the bells here. They have a lot of, uh, they're using a lot with sends and they have uh, no reverb on the, uh, they have a little bit of reverb on the channel. So kind of a mixture of both to be honest. Um, I think sends, Send and returns are good for automation to bring things up in the track as a whole group. You know, you can bring up all them bleeps all at once. You can see I have these all the same, um, the same amount of send, and then I have the, you can see the automation arm is lit up here. So I've made automation on that channel here to bring them all up at the same time and to bring this all that reverb onto it. Um, so I kind of generally use only small amounts on the sound and small amounts on the send. I don't overdo it too much. Um, yeah. Okay. I think this track is all about the arrangement. I'm going to skip over to uh, To Not Exist now. Um, I might just have to wait a second while my computer loads up this uh, project. It's a bit slow, like me. Alright, there's a question from Andrew asking, do you use just the Ableton stock reverb or do you use any other ones as well? So Andrew asked a question about the uh, using only Ableton reverb or using a lot of other ones. So in my productions nowadays, I use um, a lot of the D16 Tor reverb. Um, as I said before, I just got the UAD stuff, so I just got um, the reverb from them, which is really nice. Um, it's kind of, um, mm, it's difficult to explain, but it has a very unique algorithm. Also, what I'd recommend is the Convolution reverb from Max for Live plugins. This is amazing for kick drums. Um, this is... I guess I made a lot of kick drums through the convolution re reverb and putting that uh, 10, 15, 20% wet onto that onto the kick channel, resampling that, bouncing it down to audio, using it again because the convolution reverbs they have, uh, if when my project loads up, I'll show you uh, exactly what it is if, if somebody's not familiar with this convolution reverb from uh, the Max for Live. Um, I use a Pro R from FabFilter, Valhalla stuff. Um, and generally, each one of these things has a different colouring to the sound. My go-to right now is the Tor Reverb from D16. I love these D16 products. They're a company based out of Poland. Um, and yeah, let's have a look at that Convolution Reverb um, over here. I'm just going to mute, uh, take them away. So Max for Live, Audio Effects, and Convolution Pro Reverb Pro. Also has like EQ inside has all these different methods. So if you wanted to use it more, uh, not on a kick channel, it has a position at the reverb, so you can position to the right or to the left. It has a modulation method, so I guess that adds some sort of movement. The dampness, so you can EQ out the how dense it is, I guess, from the lower frequencies to the upper frequencies. Shape, um, 
how fast it's going to be. And it also has this amazing, um, amazing view meter here, this visual monitor thing here, so you can see exactly what you're doing to the sound. So I'd highly recommend uh, everybody to get their hands on a convolution reverb and uh, really try out its effect. And I'd recommend the one from Maxwell Live because you can see this. I have a couple of other ones from if you look at my uh, if you look at my plugins here. I have the one from Melda Production, which is also a recommended company if you haven't heard of them. It's a multiband convolution. It's a little bit tricky. Mainly, mainly you'll be diving into the presets on these and checking them out but you can see what it's doing uh, on this section here but the Convolution Reverb Pro you can really dive deep into it and you can see exactly what it's doing uh, to the sound um, okay so get rid of that and we're gonna listen to uh, To Not Exist from uh, the Soma EP um, let's see where we're starting at just gonna go forward so let's go so it's that standard kick drum again. Yeah, I have a little bit more info on how this kick drum was made. When it's played loud, yeah, it makes everything shake. Um, I think there's a few more questions. Let's see. Uh, Jan was asking, what's your number one technique you wish you were taught when you just started producing music? There's no one technique with this shit. It's just a long, long cycle. I wish I got taught to use distortion from the very beginning because I spent a lot of time not using enough distortion in my tracks. And I'm not talking about distortion like, uh, you know, this whoever I want to name, you know, this hard distorted techno. I'm talking about this, uh, this distortion which it adds character, it adds harmonics, it adds upper harmonics, it adds lower harmonics, it adds general fullness to the sound. You can take a, you can take a certain waveform or a certain kick drum and run it through a few, like for instance, Sound Toys Decapitator, and um, the sound just comes alive. And I was never doing that. I thought that I could make these kick drums from only compression and layering. Because I wasn't, I never even knew touched any of these distortion things. So I wish somebody had told me that I would have saved a few years of my production life. Do you, if you do the distortion, do you usually um, mix it in just like a little bit wet, or like put it as a parallel? Um, at the moment, I just started chaining them together. I started using them as a group effect. Um, in, in Ableton. I never used to do this. I normally would uh, just mix it in slightly, but now if I, if I, for instance, I would bring up Decapitator, um, it's going to take us a little second to load. Um, but now I just started to group the things together. So when you have an audio effect here, if I right click and I click group, it's going to bring up the group option. Um, I never used to do this before, so now it's chained. I'm just going to switch that off, so the sound's going to be off now, but I'll duplicate it. And then this is going to be the group audio effect rack without the decapitator. This one is going to be the one with. Yeah, so there is distortion on that there. And now, 
I generally start to mix it in if I put a really hard distortion method on the punish, use the punish button <laughs> on decapitator and like mix it slowly in. So you'd hear what it sounds like now. It's horrible, it's nasty. But that can make a big difference, like if it's mixed in a tiny amount because it's going to add in them extra harmonics. So let's put that track. I mean, that's them together. But if it's just a tiny little amount, then you have this. hear a difference everything is minute but them minute differences that go back to the way that the architecture is working I mean if these minute differences they can add, add a lot to the track when the whole track is complete if each one of the elements has a small detail on the on the sound then when all them details come together then it makes a final piece it's like painting a picture building a house it's all for me I have the concept of that in my mind when I make that all these minute, minute details uh, equate to the final product, equate to the final piece. Um, okay, I'm going to run through some of these sections on here. Let's turn that off. So the kick group here. Let's not start on the kick. I'm bored of kicks. Uh, I'm going to go here to the middle section. You all want to know about kicks. Um, so main sound is coming from the FM8. Uh, I opened this up, it looks like I played around with the arpeggiator on a five step sequence. Um, so it's only playing actually one note at the end of the fifth, uh, end of the fifth sixteenth, so the fifth note and uh, under, so it's just over one bar long. Not one bar, sorry. Oh, I'm confused. Um, and, uh, half of the eighth, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so just play one note there, and I think this uh, this again I was saying about the tour verb. This is on that channel. If I take that away, take the delay away, um, the sound is meh. Take away this. Um, is that the? That's me facing confused. Um, that's the chorus. Oh, is that the phaser? Yeah, that's the phaser. So put that on there. It's got a limiter on there, it's got EQ. The frequency shifter is playing an LFO, um, just a small amount, and it's gonna cycle over two bars. So once every two bars, it's gonna slightly change. Um, the LFO on the auto filter is really nice. It's just gonna cycle in the sine wave form, so it's gonna go up and down like a waving C. And it's just going to slowly glide up and down in frequencies, but only a small amount. The amount that I've tuned in there, 13.1. So it's going to go up and down, slowly, slowly, and just change that sound over time. Um, add that delay. Add that reverb, sorry. It's uh, adding in a lot of character. Adding in, you know, a bit of more feeling. The delay comes in again. It's also playing these dotted three notes because that's more of a syncopated rhythm. If I put it on the four, it's landing on the, it's landing on the, you know, it's landing on the eight, uh, one, eight, one, eight, one, blah, blah, blah. So it's a little bit boring when it's on four. So I have them on the three, it adds a little bit more urgency to the sound. Um, the way that the FM8 is designed, it's called the block bass. Um, if we look into the sequencer here, I think I modded some stuff inside the FM8 sequencer because this is a really nice, in this FM matrix, sorry. This is really nice bit of kit and you can just experiment. I mean, if you're not familiar with FM8, the way that you switch it on, you right click and you just say you want it to go, you map E to B, then you're just going to drag up the arrow there. And that means that the way that E is, E here is... Uh, a 1.5% ratio and it's playing a sine wave, E will then modulate B, and B um, will modulate E. So they all kind of form together and uh, play with each other kind of. Um, you know, you can change that sound drastically just within a few clicks. So I'd recommend FM8 to anybody which wants to make techno. It's really a uh, great synth for um, experimenting with and uh, coming up with some cool sounds, cooler than your average sound with sound wave pulse. It's coming up with a lot better sound, you know, it has all these operators in there. Okay, 
Then we go to the group, uh, kick group. sound get louder when the kick drops out. Well, yeah, George, that's very true. Um, that's why normally, I'd say these are all our productions, but before, um, now I use a trigger, which is a muted channel. It's like a ghost kick, basically. But yeah, I'm giving you a genuine uh, overview of my older productions, and nowadays I always have a trigger channel, which would look like... Uh, extra midi channel I'd have my kick here I'd have my notes uh, I'd have my note here turn it off. and then I would side chain everything to this one note here I would side chain everything to this thing and the channel would be off but it still plays the signal but the channel is off right now I think I probably made uh, my side chain so they don't poke out too much when the kick is off Sometimes it also is quite nice to have them stick out a little bit, but obviously not too much. So you just run the, you just have the MIDI signal running through the whole track for the yeah, ghost yeah, kick. for the ghost kick, yeah. For the ghost kick, yeah, the whole MIDI channel will just be for the whole track. No, no pauses, no breaks. Mm. Kind of hot in here, isn't it? It is really hot, yeah. And there's another question from Remy, he says... Randy? Remy. Oh, Remy. He, uh, that was still for the yeah, first yeah. track, but I think yeah. it doesn't matter. You were saying, I don't see much stereo placement on the different tracks or on the different channels. Uh, do you proceed to the stereo image if there is at the mix down stage or later on? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of them sounds were already wide, um, such as the hi hats were already wide. And you can kind of tell if they are or not. And I would say the, the bleeps and true lies, they were already they were already wide and lower but just by the way that they sound in the studio and the way that I can hear them from my monitors I don't want to push them all the way out to the sides um, I think they were already wide enough but now um, for instance if we look um, into the wave stuff again the S1 imager is a um, is a spreader which I would use now which is uh, so S1 imager This is a really self-explanatory, you know, it's quick, it spreads everything out and it has asymmetry so it goes in and out, you can position it left, you can position it right, uh, the rotation, how far you want it to go. So I'd recommend if you were thinking about like really spreading that stuff out then you would use the, um, you would use the width, uh, you would use this S1 imager or another tool uh, to spread the sound. But now I think sometimes the hi-hats are already um, kind of processed in that way when you're using samples like this. I really want to know how to... I don't know what happened with this utility. It changed since I knew it. It's still bugging me now, I think. It's bringing a fan to the, fan to the building. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. <coughs> um, so yes, stereo images is something to think about, but sometimes the process, uh, sometimes the samples are already processed in that way. I don't need to do anything else to them. I delete that S one. As you can see here, for instance, on the hi hats, I have the Hass spread. If you're not familiar with the Hass, it's H A A S. It's a spreading technique used with delay. So you'd put it all the way 100% wet. You would you would tame the one of the frequencies one to um, you put one at the one millisecond and you put the other one between one and 20, depending on how wide you wanted it to go. Because you don't want the delay to come in there. I don't know how much you can hear that, but you can hear that now. You just want kind of a little bit like phasing in a way. You just want them two little bits to come in there. Um, this also has, on the hi-hats here, it has the wide, which is a chorus, I think it is chorus. No, it's a phaser. 
forest wide. The phaser on the hi hats just to add that little bit of movement. It kind of uh, floating around the track, which is kind of like what this track is. It kind of floats around a little bit. Uh, overdrive again on the hi hats, of course. Let's go to the kick. Um, let's solo each section. Noise. Let's crop it so it's not too far. Okay, noise. Um, this is really key in uh, in kick drums. So I have the lexicon reverbs as well. When we were talking about reverbs before, another thing I use is the lexicon reverbs. A lot, of, a lot of uh, they're very high end stuff. Nice products. Um, again, the camel fat because this is a production also from a similar time as True Lies. I was using camel fat a lot. I guess this also has. I don't want to load it again because it was taking time before. I oh know it's good now. So that's the exciter on the top half. It has a band pass filter as well. So that's what's using my. That's what I'm using as a filter. A couple of EQs on there. Sometimes the first EQ is just to scrape away. You have to process. Then you EQ again. It, that's how I do things. I do things differently. Uh, I think this is another noise layer. Let's hear what that's doing. That's like a low thump. Also with an overdrive at the bottom. It's EQ'd. Um, to be honest, it looks like it's kind of the same kick, but just processed differently. Maybe I've pitched it. Uh, let's delete the ones. So yeah, the them two are the same, but one's like just taken as like a noise. It's just a it's just a placeholder. I've just like fucked up the sound a little bit and put like a load of reverb on there. And this one is another thump. This one is again the same kick, but the actual kick. Um, I think this should have an envelope on there, yeah. So I've rolled off this lower half. I like to dive into the envelopes and these kicks as well and round off whatever you don't want or whatever you do want. Um, that's a solid, that's a solid, solid kick. It looks solid for me. The way that the kicks look, if they're looking nice, then that's also really key for me is the way that they look. And I think if we're fast enough, then I'm going to show you about track analysis and how that can work. I have a, here I have a, um, I have a kick drum tech talk, which is a kick drum I made earlier, as they would say. Um, here, we have a bass sound. This is a process bass. It looks like the tail of a kick, to be honest. And if you don't know about this, then another method of making a nice bass sound is using the tail of a kick. You can see I have a lot of effects on there. One, two, three, four, five, six. I have about 12 effects on this track, which is camel fat, decapitator, EQ8, let's listen to how it sounds. Make sure you're using headphones or monitors. So the thing with me, I like to, I like, you have to add the character in the bass sound. You can see in the spectrum frequency, this bass has frequencies up to 1000 hertz. It has ma the majority of this in the lower section, obviously, but if you took away all them sections at the top, this 1000 hertz, it would not sound the same at 50 hertz. So I would stress that if you're all trying to make this style of music, then you need to add upper harmonics. My CPU is glitching out, of course. Just waiting for that to happen. Compressor, second glue compressor, just tame in some frequencies. Another compressor, which is sidechain compressor, sidechain to the kick. Utility, bass in mono. So under 120 hertz is mono, EQ, another EQ, and another EQ. Let's see what the Pro Q2 is doing. Just all carving that out because you know I've added on two two different types of distortion. I've added on two different compressors, and they all need you know you fatten up the sound and you take it away because if I left all them all untamed, they would uh, be they would be a mess. next layer in this yeah there was a question or a few questions about arrangement and automation um, for example rich was asking um, do you run or what kind of automations do you run to create movement in your tracks yeah it's a good question and it's something that i think about a lot <laughs> yeah it's a good question it is something that i think about a lot um, creating movement in the track um, and I stress again that these are older productions of mine so 
things change and weeks and months and days my method of making music is changing if you follow me on instagram i'm sure you see that i'm in the studio most days um so things are changing constantly one thing that i like to do right now is um use the max for live plugins it's a midi effect or it's an audio effect you can use either of them depending on whether you're using an uh, MIDI channel or an audio channel you can use the LFO here so this LFO uh, when it loads you can see that adds rate it's had depth you can map and you just one click to the other channel and now you can see I obviously this is not really it's just a uh, map now to the dry and wet of the delay and it's moving slowly over the course of time and you can change this so it's on a synced rate so I could change this to 16 so every 16 bars this sound is going to slowly slowly evolve and change it's going to dip in and out so the dry and wet obviously it's just a sh shitty explanation let me put it on an auto filter which is better explanation uh go here lfo to here um so let's change the depth map it so we map it to the frequency at the top this is going to change that that sound so it's going to bring the filter down it's going to bring the filter out and when you have it on the synced rate over 16 bars then it's going to slowly 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 um bring out that sound and that's great for not ha not having to do any automation you just let the lfo tool you let you let your arsenal of tools do the work for you in a way um so this lfo tool over over the course of the track we'll be finally adjusting uh, the auto filter and what I like to do now is also uh, map the LFO to a certain band on uh, EQ8 so I would just grab an EQ8 here and take away that frequency range and say if I had this band 3 here that you can see and I map, um, map that to the uh, gain um, then where are we now if we let's play this sound let's put it on a bit faster so you can see what it's doing there now it's bouncing up and down it's going up going up and down different rates on the synced rate so every every eighth of a bar it's going up um every sixth of a bar quarter of a bar it's going up so one two one two uh half a bar one three yeah whatever and then every bar it'll go up and down you can change the depth so it'll go like really far up really far down the offset is how high it starts off at already sorry my computer's a little bit glitchy um so if you if you've had it down there then it will start off lower the offset makes it you have the medium in the middle the offset is either side where you want it kind of to start and stop um and with that with a slow rate it's going to add like a nice bit of movement throughout the track um especially on if you're using an auto filter and the uh, eq8 as well um as well as doing this i uh, automate um you know as you can see here i automate auto filters using a kind of a cutoff if this track doesn't have cutoff because i work a lot in audio um, and i think a lot a lot of like reverbs on the sense as you can see here there's a lot of reverb on these sense Again here, I use this uh, high function on the EQ8 because it's so easy to grab this uh, reverb from Ableton. This uh, high section on the Ableton reverb is going up and down, um, also acting like a cutoff, but only for the reverb. So that adds the interest as well throughout the track. Uh, if you look at the whole track for this main synth part, it's changing throughout the whole track. It's going up and down. Um, so. Another method is to grab your MIDI keyboard, MIDI controller, map something, map the whole track with this thing, which is sometimes what I do. Maybe I'll map a four bar loop with different automation levels and then run that out for your track because then at least you're adding interest to that four bars. Let's go back to the kick again. This is a kick I made earlier. Again, always what I made earlier. Also has a little bit of reverb on the kick here. Lex Hall, again. 3% anything more just a tiny little bit always just a tiny little bit because as I said this these little bits add they they come together in the end piece 
this here, I ducked a little bit of 133, probably just to get rid of that little bit of muddiness. And also I'm using a few layers, so each layer has to kind of like clear up itself. So I think that if people are wanting to make these style of kick drums, then you need to be, don't be afraid of the EQ, but be afraid of the EQ because <laughs> you can destroy or you can, you can really, you can, you can destroy a track or you can really make a track. So just really improve your skills on the I think a lot of um, a lot of this techno low end is to do with reverbs, but really masked reverb reverbs. There was a question on how you create your bleep sounds. Do you use any special plugin or hardware or yeah, the bleep sounds? Yeah. Um, yeah, the question about the bleep sounds. Um, so if we're still talking about true lies, I don't actually know if I went into detail on how I made them sounds. I said they was made via um, a mini Moog, s mini Moog uh, emulation inside this KV331 synth. And the upper half of these bleeps were from a FM sine wave um, kind of m amalgamation like brought together um the bleep sounds most of the time the bleep bleep sounds are coming from sine waves but it's not going to be one sine wave it's going to be coming from multiple sine waves and the thing is that you need to make sure that these sine waves are all playing off each other you know you need one that's a really low pitch you need one that's a really high pitch you need one in the middle um this is how it's going to work if you want to make bleepy techno you need to use sine waves and you need to be able to color them sine waves with um, with different with different effects like small bits of distortion layers. Um, so yeah, just experiment with sine waves, multiple layers of sine waves. I mean, you can get a good sine wave uh, from operator in the instrument section in uh, in Ableton. Y this is an FM synth as well. And they have some great presets in there. And you grab Operator, and you grab Max for Live, uh, ML185 sequencer. You add them together, and you play around with them and see what results you're going to get and uh, resample stuff and do it that way. This track, I used Reactor 6, which I absolutely love. This is just uh, more of a textured layer. Um, as you can see here, it's just a preset called Wand. Um, this, uh, this reactor is just a sustained kind of lead sound it's just playing one note on a playing one note on a quarter of a bar this is rising throughout the track and this is something that i i didn't do this this is something which we acted it um this is uh rising maybe some lfos or uh has like a really slow lfo on here so that's rising throughout the track it's kind of fading in and out and you take away these certain elements and um, and they the track doesn't sound the same i don't think these little tiny bits they all add this little bit of atmosphere and what i thought about when i looked back at this track is there's a lot of noise in here so there's there's a tape noise here which is a tape uh sample from uh, i'll show you the pack here um where is it now? Um, dirt and layers. I think that's also a gold baby thing as well. So dirt samples tape has all these tape elimination digital, more like crispy style, like uh, vinyl. It also has like guitar hums and things like that. They're great to add into the back of a track because I think that um, I think uh, background texture is really vital to this to making electronic music because if you were listening to a band you know they have the 
room reverbs, they have all these different little artifacts coming into the sound, especially like older sa- older music from like the sixties or something, you know, they have a lot of bits of crackle coming maybe from the microphone or bleed coming from the guitar and if you want to make electri- electronic music which sounds authentic then I think you need to add even like samples of these certain sounds and I think freesound.org is a great place to make uh, to take some of these sounds from as well. another question about the bleep sounds <laughs> um, how do you control the resonance on the bleep sounds or how do you tame them in general yeah this is this is a good question because these bleep sounds um, fortunately in the true lies track my the sounds which I chose to use they were not too resonant but in a track of mine called your rhythmic they, they were quite difficult to tame and it's all about using the EQ8 and let me show you here on the new EQ8 get to the end of this shit uh, so EQ8 here you have all these different bands switch them all on um, use the Q levels and then if you separate out each each tiny bleep like this then and then use the scale function as well here I think also on the uh, FabFilter Pro 2, it's also uh, it's also a little bit easier to drag out them them problem frequencies in them. So I would um, generally take out the resonances, and then I would um, compress them afterwards. Only a small amount of compression, just to like take away the resonances. And then bring out the rest of bring out the rest of what is remaining away from the resonances with the compression. Um, I did have I thought I had an example of these problem resonances. Um, what's this group here? This group little ticky thing. I'm always using these little small ticky things in my tracks, just small amounts of texture and interest. You can see here that this is has a, a lot of automation on from the auto frequency. This is also a resampled layer. Um, it's so just small little bits of interest because that's all going to glue it together, you know. Going back to this ethos of uh, building a house, you know, you start with the foundations, you put under small bits of decor, you paint the windows, you do all these little things, you add on all these different things, you put on all these different places. Um, this adds, this adds to track, this is what builds it, and especially when you're making techno music, it's kind of so, uh, so minimal that if you listen to this, if you listen to this in theory, you would think there's a kick, a hi-hat, a main synth. But there's there's probably five or six other layers, which if they're taken away, the track is not going to sound the same. So if I just left, like, uh, let me solo this stuff. So if I, sorry, the computer's glitching a little bit. Um, if I just left these two, if these three, the track doesn't really sound the same. And I mean, I've only got three layers soloed. Um, I have another, however many, like 19 tracks in there, which um, which make fill out the frequency range basically. What's your approach on arrangement of tracks? Do you sometimes like jam with clips as well, or is it purely arrangement view? Um, yeah, the arrangement view, uh, the arrangement of tracks. It all comes. It all. It's difficult. I think each track is different, and I personally have a little bit of a problem with this myself because I feel like all my tracks start the same and finish the same. They all have this, you know, up and down. But what what I got taught about and what I'd recommend is a book from Ableton. It's um, 
it's called creative strategies for um like uh creative strategies for musicians but research is on the ableton website and they said about subtractive arrangement which is as if you said that your track was going to be six and a half minutes long you would drag every element that you have in your track to six and a half minutes so it'd be just like a looking like a brick wall from there you'd hit play you would say what you don't want you would separate that section and if you don't know the command then on ableton you can highlight a section command e and it breaks it then delete command e all your different sections that you don't want and continue working like that so it's kind of like a backwards method but um when i read that i tried that um method and especially for techno music which is kind of it's always full from the start it's always um it's always uh you know it's these minute differences so being full you know i don't know how to explain it properly but I would say the subtractive arrangement, if you research on Google, uh, subtractive arrangement Ableton, it's going to come up with some hints and tricks of how to uh, subtractively arrange tracks, which is just basically deleting what you don't want. And um, so, yeah, it's kind of difficult. Uh, there's another method as well, which is, uh, say, in a folder here, I have reference tracks. Some of the tracks they're from Shlomo, Shlomo. I have one from Roldan, the Wicked Producer, M Malero, and another Antigon and Shlomo. Um, because I love their productions, love the way that they're arranged. I think they're really high quality, really classy French techno. Um, and so if you if you drag and drop one of them in there, and you make some analysis notes of where stuff is coming in and out. Um, and also just generally listen to stuff, like have a little notepad, like sometimes in my notepad I'll listen to a track and I'll say one minute 30 hi-hat comes in, one minute 45 hi-hat comes out, you know, you have to get quite geeky with this and get quite in-depth with it. And it's all about um, wanting to keep the most interest. So if you're listening to the track, you start to get bored. Like what, like what do you do to change that? Like how is your creative method to add interest? Because at the end of the day, if you're releasing music then there's going to be a lot of people which are listening to this track, and um, they're not go they don't they don't want to get bored halfway through. Then there's like a general question about gear and VSTs. Yeah. If you could recommend anything, or like what you're using at the moment. Yeah. So um, I had a couple of other bits to show you this is to not exist that was that track from soma um kind of explained it a little bit maybe not too much i mean if anybody wants to ask me a question about that track then they can ask some more but we're going to scoot on to the next thing this is a track which i've been working on uh recently don't know how it's going to sound to be honest just i'm making tracks every day i'm making new tracks every day i'm making all these all this stuff like most days i come up with a new track um some of it's finished, some of it's unfinished, some of it sounds good, some of it sounds bad. So um, um, I will show you when it loads. But generally, uh, VSTs I'll be using. I use a lot of Rob Pappen stuff. Uh, if you've heard of Rob Pappen, he's a really great, um, really great designer of these. Um, he's done a whole bunch of sub boom bass, uh, Blue Two Predator. I use I use Blue Two from him quite a lot. Um, as well as if you want to look at my plugins folder here, then um, Dimitri Sek Shex Shes Shes he's making some stuff. This diversion's amazing. Tantra and Torn, uh, I've mentioned them before in an interview. I think they're amazing stuff. Um, I don't really use Silent that much anymore. Native Instruments, I'll use Massive mainly. FM8, um, as I mentioned, the K three three one Synth Master. This is one of my go-to synths because it's so easy to uh, adjust and uh, change and fuck up kind of. Synapse June is kind of good, it's kind of a little bit EDM style though. Um, let's play something that I've been working on recently. This was uh, just from the other day I guess. Let's see. So, yeah. yeah, it also has this trigger which somebody was talking about before. So. 
it's just a small trigger here. It's a clave, so it's really short. You know, it's a it's only 20 milliseconds long, so that's a really easy, uh, snappy sidechain tool. And now you can see I have the UAD plugins. I'm not gonna make you jealous, but they're really good. Like this, uh, the bottom effect here. So you're just gonna add in some psychoacoustics to the lower half of the sound. This is on a 50% effect, so so it just adds in a little bit of. Um, stuff at the bottom, you know, a little bit of noisy stuff. This position EQ is just a multi-band EQ, midfield, mid, mid range, high, high range, low, and you can change the frequency bands as well. So you can see it sounds a little bit more accomplished than my previous tracks. Um, like this way that it sounds, I think it sounds like a lot better. This was one of the resonances that we were talking about before. So as you can see, I've put on this really, uh, I don't know the name for that one again. I think it's like a node, uh, uh, what is it? No, it's a notch. It's a notch EQ there. And if we highlight that frequency, that's real singy. That's real resonant. And if that's still in the track, you can hear that. You can hear a big difference. So that's taken out with a notch EQ. Um, and how to set our sound tran uh, transforms basically, even with the slight touch of one of them. I have, I, I use in all these D16 products, so here you can see the Devastator, UAD again, uh, this tube compressor, I really like, um, compression sidechain again. So you can see it sounds, I guess this is what happens, you know, you have to take time with production, it doesn't happen overnight. I mean, the tracks that I released, True Lies and Two Not Exist, they're about a year, a year and a half old, and they can already tell the big difference listening to these, listening to these tracks in, in this environment. They sound a lot cleaner, they sound a lot sharper, but that just comes over time. And uh, I'm using these um, samples from, in the track in this one, most of the samples are coming from a guy, uh, Matthias Friedel. Guy Matthias Friedel, he did a bunch of giveaway sample facts. I think they're now on his um, now on his bandcamp. So you can see they have uh, they have all these things here, and they're really really nicely processed. And this is a techno producer. He used to release a lot in the 90s. He still releases a bit now. Um, really talented production, but scanning through them hi hats, they're just really crisp and clean. So it's all about what method you use as well. Ah, maybe. Um, so it's all about what samples you use because it, if you you can't polish something which is bad, basically. Um, and these, yeah, you can see this MFS. This is Matthias Friedel samples hi hat. So he's working a lot with velocities and things like this. You can see it here, velocities. And um, now I'm also using like a lot of the groove pools. Uh, so if you go into the core library, you go into swing and groove, you um, go on to some of these MPC, for instance. So MP616, so for it sounds here. Um, and then if I solo the shakers, oh, it's not the shakers here, it's the shakers. Then I go on the groove. It's gonna slightly add a little bit of swing you can hear the little bit of swing changing. Um, so if I go commit, you'll see what happens. So you can see that a few of the points have adjusted over into different sections. Um, I'm not going to commit to that because it doesn't sound so good. Um, again, there's kind of a like a low perk percussion noise. This is also coming from Matthias Friedel's um, sample pack. It's got Devastator. It's got Pro-Q, uh, it's got Sigmund, uh, which is also a D16 plugin. Um, it's also D16 delay. And I think using these third-party plugins inside Ableton, that's why they're there. That's they do add another level of stuff. So if you can save up and you can buy maybe uh, you can buy the Pro Q3 for 150 euros or something, it's well worth that investment. A lot of these other plugins as well. So if we look at the kick here, this is a kick that I kind of made earlier as well. Um, one thing that I'll show you here, this is just a reverb layer. 
the way that I made this reverb layer, I will try and I'll just duplicate this kick and I'll show you how I made this reverb layer. So you can hear this kick is now ha as it sounds. Then we'll go to lexicon stuff, we'll go to chamber because you want a big, long, long reverb on this. You can hear that there. Turn it all the way up. Um, this pre delay on this is really nice, it makes that sucking kind of effect. I'm not going to use any of the EQs on the on the lexicon, but um, diffusion. Just experiment with that and bring it up and down. Early level. So you can still hear the kick when the early level is in there. So take that out. Uh, the stereo width. I can make it mono afterwards. So here, then I'm going to make a new um, audio channel. And then I'm going to go resampling. I'm going to cut my loop breaks down. I'm going to cut that loop breaks down. We can start from there. And then I'm just going to hit that arm record button. I'm going to hit record at the top. And it's going to record exactly what is playing through that sound. You can even do that through... Um, I could also right click on that. I could freeze the track. But that's going to freeze the whole track. And it's going to take quite a long time. Um, so you can see here... It's got that texture, it's got that, um, it's all about the upper harmonics and when you're looking at the channels you can see that this gritty stuff here, that's um, where the waveform is kind of getting manipulated into a certain sound and it's adding in, it's kind of chopping up maybe a sine wave or something and it adding that texture, the grit, the upper harmonics to the sound. So if I look again at this, I will just take a... a uh, beat loop and turn it down then you have that there I don't know how it sounds at home but here it sounds alright so I've made the start made that start point there if we look at this uh, spectrum analyzer again I think you should always have a spectrum analyzer on the master channel that's kind of a nice reverb and that would, would sit in I can't really hear it so well but it sounds like it would sit quite well with a side chain so this one here, I'm going to delete that fully wet um, kick here, delete that one and go back to my original source. And sidechain um, this to SM kick, which is the top mass kick number 204. So it already sounds kind of alright there. We're going to sidechain it just slightly because you don't want it to pump too much. And if you were afraid of it pumping too much because of the upper harmonics in this reverb sound, then make yourself a little rack. Make yourself a low mid high rack. And I use this with Multifine Dynamics. So I solo the lows, solo the mids, solo the highs, and have it in a low and have it in an audio effect rack. So now I can just go to the compressor, I can drag it onto the lows and only the lows will now be affected. So that would just separate the bass frequencies, the kick and the bass frequencies from the from the um, reverb tail. I mean, that is just a real uh, quick, quick rundown. I mean, it takes a lot more than that. You would have to sculpt it, add on some distortion, maybe add on some tube, maybe add on some tape, but that should be a kind of bass point then if you wanted to expand more then let's have a look at how that's looking it's kind of got enough bass in there already because it's still hitting there I unless it really was necessary then I would never add another sine wave um, sine wave uh, sound into the bottom hit somewhere in the low regions so that's a real quick trick of how to do it also on this one kick here Let's have a look at the plugins again. Um, let's open up D16 Tor Reverb on the main kick. Let's just solo the main kick. So you can hear, you don't really want that to sound the whole time. So you right click, oops, a right click group. Um, let's turn it off, duplicate it. One will be wet. This one's going to be wet. Off the dry on the tour of we can delete that, we don't need it. And then mixing the dry. 
dry so that's how the dry sounds Just adds like that little cathedral style warehouse techno sound. Yeah, it's just a real quick method, like delving deep into that way of doing it. Don't put the wet on too hard on this uh, on the wet channel. You just want to touch. You just want to make elongate that sound to just bring it out, just to make it feel alive, kind of. Um, yeah. Let's just try it again. Um, a question from a little bit earlier. Jack was asking, how do you go about setting your channel's levels so everything fits together? I think he means except by listening. Is there any other method that you... Um, so I guess some sort of gain staging. Um, it's all a method that I always come back to is um, using your master to master volume. Take it all the way down and creep it slowly up when you're in the studio or on headphones just bring it slowly up i mean i think i kind of mix this track quite well so it's, it sounds all right so you would be looking for anything which is sounding overly loud you'd be looking to see if the hi-hats were too loud or if the kick was too loud or your main synth was too loud and keep it at that low 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 volume and just maybe I would say that my synth sound is a little bit too loud here. So um, go to utility, just knock it down maybe 2 dB. And all these minor adjustments are going to make a big difference. That's, that's why I say it's all about these minute details which craft the sound. And there's so many good producers out there with these minute details. And I'm obsessed with finding out like how they did this or how they did that like uh, like trying to like replicate that, just replicate that stuff myself or um, trying to do that myself and I think uh, like Antigon and Shlomo and much respect to them guys are making incredible music uh, all very well mixed I look at the waveforms of their tracks and it's, it's amazing I would say like Cleric exactly as well Matrix They all uh, are. They all are wizards, you know. You have to really craft that sound, and you have to. Um, it really takes a long time, really long time. I love to get up to that level. Um, yeah. Um, just a quick shout out to Soma Records, her triangle agency Paloma for for cross posting the streams. Obviously oh, also ho ho ho. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, obviously also thanks to Sam for, for doing the talk. I think we can do a few more questions before we have to wrap it up. So if you do have any questions, write them in the comment section now. And I do have one already. Um, how did your collab with Matrix Man happen? And when, for heaven's sake, can we, can we expect another one? <laughs> So me and Charlie now, we've been friends for a number of years. It, it mainly happened off, off a mutual respect for each other's music. And we kind of, I, he bought some stuff off my Bandcamp page and I saw this his email address and I messaged him and I was like, yo, you don't need to buy the, the music. I will just send it to you. Um, and then he, we just had a series of exchanges and then we met up in Berlin. And um, we went pretty much directly to the studio to my studio um, up at Frankfurt Alley um, and we we had our first session it went quite well then we came up with like a devised plan of like what sound we want to go for what elements we want to use so we made ourselves a sample pack and we only use them sounds he came up with a bunch of melodies he's a genius for writing nice melodies and um, so that's how it all began um, the second the second one, if you look here, we have uh, we have our stuff, which is we're we're ready to roll. We have uh, 
Matrix Monster Turk Must here. We we got about three tracks ready to to go um, once they're finally tuned. Uh, so there will be another there will be another collaboration between ourselves soon. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. Question from Jackson: Can you do a real quick rundown of Vortex? A real quick rundown of Vortex. Okay. So it started off. We have uh, we had our sample pack here, which you can see Matrix Monster Turk Mass. Charlie made um, Charlie Matrix Man. He made uh, an amazing respace in in Massive because we had the main melody, we had the main thing going. I don't know if I can find it here. If it's already vortex. Okay. This. Uh, so here vortex. Let me listen to it. So them them lower bleep sounds there. I think most of it is coming from Massive. Um, and also Diva, the Yuhi stuff is really great. Uh, it's coming from Diva. The drums, it's mostly my drums. Um, and uh, the rising uh, sound here that you can hear is from, uh, that's also from Massive, um, using the filter envelopes. The second sound, this bass, re-space style, that's from Massive. And that's what program. Uh, that's what Charlie programmed from scratch. It was a blank oscillators, blank three oscillators, and he, he's he's a real uh, genius with this stuff. He programmed this how exactly how he wanted it. Rooted all the LFOs, and uh, so that's kind of like a home built patch. He's really uh, he's got a real gift for that. Um, then there's like a real general question: um, How do you come up with your melodies and rhythms? I'm not sure. If that's, um, that's difficult because they're all kind of different but uh, just experimentation everything in the music is experimentation so let's have a look here I mean it looks kind of daunting when you have this uh, this sequencer in front of you just hitting notes and it doesn't really work but I would follow some sort of path you know here I have um, I have my keys and I have my scales um, so this is, uh, say for instance, you want to work out what key you want to write the music in. If you listen to different uh, scales, then you might find a scale which resonates with you the most. So here um, I have this, uh, this is in uh, G natural minor, which is a nice scale of keys. Um, is there one that you come back to a lot, like one G scale? G natural yeah. minor, yeah, F minor. I would say that they are they're key ones that I keep on coming back to. I mean, I do like A, but A, you know, it's all just all the white keys. It kind of gets a little bit boring after a while. <laughs> um, let's see what happens here. Um, um, it's really difficult to come up with melodies. It's p something that people struggle a lot with. And... Um, I would st again say come back to this ML185 sequencer because this sequencer you can kind of come up with random random melodies but then if you make a separate MIDI track oops if I can uh, grab that command yep so I can go MIDI from main stab here and I can record them MIDI notes or in theory I should have been able to record the MIDI notes. But you can record the MIDI notes coming out of a sequencer. And you can then see exactly where the MIDI notes are hitting. And um, then you can delete, you can add, you can do some velocity and you find out what's applicable to you. I think maybe one last thing before we wrap up. Is there like maybe some like a track coming up that you're releasing soon that we can hear a quick preview of or anything like that yeah um, oh wow um yeah i'm currently uh finishing off my next um sk11 number nine and because most of us are in quarantine or we're pretty much in quarantine in this crisis right now that's why we're doing a live stream from paloma bar in berlin um the reason why uh, I have this <laughs> extensive EP coming out, which is not an LP, it's definitely not an album. I'm not going to class this as an album. This is just a bunch of tracks which has been written over the course of the past three or four months. Um, my computer's really slow. I have to apologize for that. 
Um, so it's going to be an eight track EP. It's going to be a uh, similar style to SK11 number seven, which was a part one, part two. But it's going to this one's going to come out in a purely um, one package. So it's going to be a sp it's going to be a gate folded vinyl sleeve, some really nice artwork from um, a guy called Ross, um, based out in London. Ah, here he goes, come straight up. So it's going to be called Neo Noir, Neo Noir. Um, let's have a scan through some of these tracks. Um, hope it's not too loud. Let me. This track I've been playing a lot in my DJ sets. So I'm just going to scan through them. These are not masters, these are just pre masters, or not even pre masters, just how they came out. Um, next one. They're all kind of up tempo stuff. Um, yeah, I really like this A2 track technique. Tech Noir, I've been playing this in my sets a lot. I hope it's not too loud. These are the first three tracks, then the B2 is like the typical experimental one. I would have liked to show you some of the experimental music that I'm making, but there's not enough time. Um, this is a solid one. So you can see they're all different ones. They're so coming out of Ableton a little bit different each time, but when the master is sorted, then it'll be nice. Or mostly up tempo, like plus 136, I guess. 138. This one's probably the slowest magic carpet ride. Some sort of plastic man tribute, as acid line. Not really acid line, but gritty thing. And then the final track is going to be this electro. Um, and that's going to be the next release. It's not mastered yet, so it's going to be maybe three months from now. So, yep, I think Sick. that's. Thanks for the preview, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think let's wrap it up. Um, yep. Just a few words before we finish. Um, make sure to join the Tech Talk newsletter for upcoming events, because there will be a few more live streams in the next couple of weeks. And yeah, obviously, thanks to Sam. Um, if it's possible, do like a virtual applause for him. <laughs> and thanks for tuning in. Thank you for tuning in.